if the Wright brothers are expecting to crash the plane multiple times and rebuild it, what are the odds of the Smithsonian flying their plane successfully the first time? On the other hand, if you launch your plane over the Potomac and it doesn't work, it sinks. So they lost the plane. They literally, on the first time they tried it, the plane sank. And they had no more plane. Meanwhile, the Wright brothers, who the Smithsonian had contempt for, because they weren't scientists, they didn't have credentials, and they were just two bicycle mechanics inventing aviation, managed to get a plane to fly when the Smithsonian couldn't. Now, I'm telling the story for this purpose. Real technological change comes from the people who make it. That's why Steve Jobs invented the first commercially successful personal computer. It's why Bill Gates took relatively adequate but not brilliant software and built a huge corporation. People, they just go out and do it. And what we, what we have failed to do with science is open up paths for people who aren't credentialed and people who, who haven't gone through a process of convincing their peers. And we need a parallel, a ventilator, if you will. We need, we need a zone where people who just are smart and aggressive and willing to try it out can go try it. So I'd like a couple examples. I'd like to see a billion dollar tax-free prize for the first hydrogen engine that can be mass reproduced for thirty or forty thousand dollars per car. You would change the entire energy equation of the planet. You would change the global warming pro future. You would, you, would, you would have an enormous impact. And, I, and the reason I want to go for a billion dollar plus prize is simple. I think it ought to be tax-free just because I think Americans operate mentally in a world where if it's tax-free, they somehow think it's really valuable. If you were offering them $2 billion with, it, with taxes or a billion tax-free, even though a billion is not as much as $2 billion, it sounds like it's more because they love the idea of not paying the government. There's a deep, there's a deep American cultural aversion to taxation. Uh, but what I want to do is say this is not just about you know, Ford or Chrysler or, or GM or even Toyota and, and, and what have you. What I want to say is any smart group of graduate students anywhere in the country who want to stay up late at night and work all weekend, if they can figure out how to do this, fine. They get to be rich. And you'll suddenly see an explosion of ideas. I, I was told by a very senior person in the Air Force that they were convinced if, if, if you look at the NASA plan, and NASA is one of the great frustrations of modern time because it is a cumbersome, tired bureaucracy which plans too much and practices too little, and, and which has gotten us sunk into two huge sinkholes of money, the shuttle and the space station. So we're actually, if, I grew up right with Sputnik. And if you look at where we should be today and where we are today, it has been a victory of bureaucracy over science to avoid progress. It's really tragic. Well, I had, a, I had a guy who said, if you look at the NASA plan for going to Mars, which is about a 30-year plan costing about $240 billion, most of which will be spent on meetings and planning and paper and talking to each other and trying to avoid risk. He said, if you would just put up $20 billion tax-free, there are sufficient, and if you called it the 21st century America's Cup, if you look at the number of people who go out and spend an amazing amount of money to win a yacht race, spend years of their life trying to win this yacht race. He said, if we had the same excitement about getting to Mars, the number of billionaires available on the planet to put up money would mean that we would be on the moon within three or four years and we'd be, in, we'd be back to, we'd be at Mars decades before NASA and we would save the taxpayer about $200 billion. But it's a, notice what I'm describing. It's a totally different kind of design. I want to raise one last question because I, I want to be a little provocative about your own experiences. How many of you uh, in high school knew somebody who cheated? Virtually every hand. Is that a fair way to say it? I want you to think about that. I'll ask you a second question. If we had had a reward system and said, we'll give you a bonus if you get out in three years, how many of you could have gotten through high school in three years? Okay. How many could have gotten through in two years? Almost half the room. Uh, how many of you could have gotten through in one year? One, two. Th only think about it. Okay. Now, what if we'd had the same process from first grade on? That is, what if we had said, you get to learn as rapidly as you can learn, and we will reward you if you learn faster than the curriculum. How many of you think you could have learned faster than the system you were in? 
I, I just, there's, there's, a, there's a purpose to this. I, I, I want to I wrap up with this and go to questions, but I, I want to tell you about two quick things. I, I, many years ago, I studied Abraham Maslow's work in, in which he talked about a hierarchy of needs, and he talked about self-actualizing personalities, and, and the idea that, that the ideal person, the person who's the happiest, the healthiest, is a person who's doing something they really believe in. And, and I was watching people here at the Human Computer Interface Program where you saw people who loved what they were doing. They were, they were having, you know, this is great. They get, the, the genius of America is to encourage people to find a hobby that you love doing and then get somebody to pay you 40 hours a week to do your hobby. And then for the next 40 hours a week, you do your hobby for free because it's your hobby. Every great successful person I know puts in 70 or 80 hours a week, and they do it at something they love doing, and they think they're privileged to be allowed to do it. Whether they're a medical doctor, or an investor, or an entrepreneur, or a scientist, they love the game they're playing. But notice how exact opposite that is to the bureaucracy we've now built that we call education. Where we'd say to you, no, no, you don't want to learn that this year, that's three years from now. And so what I'm suggesting here is a very fundamental rethinking of what we're doing. And, and, and I, I, we happened to go, Chris and I happened to visit recently Jim Lair, who's a great sports psychologist, who talks about engagement. And he says, and he studied great athletes and people who can really focus and really do brilliantly, and he works with special forces and the FBI and others. How do you, what is it about a person who at that key moment can bring all of their ability to bear, this is what great scientists and great technicians do, they bring all their ability to bear on solving this problem. And he says it comes at four layers, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. That people who are really, really good are on a journey. I mean, whether it's Tiger Woods becoming the greatest golfer in history, uh, or it's Michael Jordan being the best basketball player, or it's somebody winning the Nobel Prize in science, or it is somebody becoming extraordinarily wealthy, but they're, they're doing their thing. I mean, they're into the zone where they love what they're doing, and because they love what they're doing, they are emotionally balanced, they're mentally balanced, and they're able then to get things, they're able to have their body do things and to endure things people can't normally do. And what struck me as he talked about this, and talks about the concept of engagement, which Gallup, the Gallup poll people also talk about, that when you get people who are truly engaged, they're really living their life, they're really, in, they're really excited, they really have tremendous energy, and they really like what they're doing. And I said, well, in that context, tell me your reaction to, to modern education. And he said, they are systems of disengagement. The teachers are disengaged, the curriculum is boring, you have to move at a pace that isn't your personal pace. And the result is we actually teach kids to slow down. And we teach them to achieve less than their capability. And so part of what I'm suggesting to you is there's going to be a renaissance worldwide. It's going to happen. Whether or not America is at the cutting edge of it is a function of how much courage we have to fundamentally rethink our research system, to fundamentally rethink our tax and litigation and, 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 and regulation system, and to fundamentally rethink education. If we move to a system where we liberate young Americans and say to them, you get to be as smart and as engaged and as committed as you want to be. And you get to learn as fast as you can learn. And we're going to use human computer interfaces matched up with brain science to give you the best capability of learning on the planet. And we're going to let you learn like crazy if you want to. And we're going to let you pick something you want to make a living at that gets you excited so you get up every day being really happy because you're getting to pursue happiness in the best of all ways, which is being creative. That renaissance would rival Florence in the 16th century and would give us a chance to truly be an explosion of creativity worldwide. And that's, I think, the great challenge for your generation. And I'll just close with this observation. The generation of the founding fathers went to college at 13. The average entrance at Princeton in the 1770s was at 13 years of age because you were a child and then you were a young adult. They didn't, they, adolescence wasn't invented until the 19th century. Adolescence is a device to get you to watch MTV and sit around doing nothing while you wait to get old enough to quit having to live with your parents so you can actually go do something. <laughs> Questions, comments? Do, do we want to use microphones? Is that, does that help? Okay. All right, so somebody with a microphone has to find you. Um, I, I really think uh, that what you had to say was amazing because, for instance, in high school, I think my knowledge base really deteriorated because 
I was homeschooled from fifth through eighth grade, and I learned more during that time because my mom let me sit on my own and then looked over my work than I ever did in high school. But what I really